thank you so much to Christina and well and to CQC for inviting me to come and talk. It's a, it's a great uh, pleasure and privilege to be here. Um, so uh, yeah, the, as Christina mentioned, I, I, this the sort of topic. I was actually going to start by by preemptively apologising to anyone who came to the talk I gave in Oxford a couple of weeks ago. But looking through the list of participants, I'm not sure that anyone was there. So maybe it's not so bad. But anyway, if anyone did happen to watch that talk, uh, the content of this one will be broadly similar. But I'll try and say some. Uh, I'll try and say things a little bit differently. Or uh, and there are a couple of new results that I might mention towards the end. Uh, but yes, basically. Uh, as Christina mentioned, this is um, the, the, this is kind of presenting some recent work that's been done on connecting this thing called the Wolfram model, which is a sort of discrete uh, space-time formalism uh, that's similar to kind of to a sort of algorithmic variant of causal set theory that we've been developing for the last uh, year or so, um, and the and the sort of the foundations of, of categorical quantum mechanics, and and specifically the ZX calculus as developed by by Ross, who's here, and Bob, who I think might be virtually here, uh, or. or here in some in some time skipped sense, um, and so essentially fr from a kind of from a broadly philosophical standpoint, the, the the point of connection comes from both the Wolfram model and the ZX calculus are interested in um, describing kind of processes in fundamental physics in terms of diagrammatic rewriting rules defined over combinatorial objects. And so, um, just to start off with, I'm going to sort of give you a very quick introduction to what the Wolfram model is all about, and then I'll explain how it connects to quantum information theory, categorical quantum mechanics, and how we've been able to use the ZX calculus uh, in order to prove kind of newer, stronger results about our own formalism, and also uh, discuss some, some ways in which I think the kinds of approaches that we've been developing might be of relevance to people who work in, in QIT and, and specifically who are interested in, in uh, questions about, about ZX. So uh, let me just begin by saying that, uh, that this work was, was done in uh, that the Original work I'm going to be presenting here was done in collaboration with Manojna Namaduri and Zuxi Zasawala. And the underlying model, as the name suggests, was not developed by us. It was developed by Stephen Wolfram and, and subsequently refined by various people, including myself. Um, but anyway, okay, so what's the basic setup? The setup is um, what we, we define kind of manifold-like objects using combinatorial structures. So, so in particular, we we've, we've opted to use sort of hypergraphs as being like our analog to Riemannian manifolds. Uh, there's no particularly fundamental reason for choosing hypergraphs. It's just that they happen to be a very kind of minimal combinatorial object. You can, you can just represent them as, as collections of ordered relations between elements. So, uh, so we start from, yeah, from, from some hypergraph, which is you know, just some, some generalization of an ordinary graph in which edges connect you know, arbitrary non-empty subsets of vertices. So here's you know, an example of, of a hypergraph with, uh, where all hyperedges have arity two. Here's an example where all hyperedges have arity three. Um, that, so the, the hypergraphs kind of give us the, the static of our formalism, so the, the statics of the formalism, and the dynamics are then defined in terms of uh, transformation rules, in terms of uh, what we call set substitution rules. So because each hypergraph can be represented as just a, a, a set of ordered relations between elements, uh, you can define a rewriting rule on, on, those, on, on such hypergraphs by just saying, let me take a, a subset that matches a particular pattern and replace it with a subset that matches a different pattern. And so here's an example of such a hypergraph transformation rule. And so what then, th that then allows us to do is to start from some very simple initial hypergraph, like this kind of double self-loop initial condition. And then by applying a particular set substitution rule like this one down here, you evolve it into some rather rich and complicated looking hypergraph. Um, and that, as I say, that effectively de defines the dynamics of the model. Um, but already at this point, there are a couple of subtleties that you might have, uh, you might have noticed. Um, perhaps one of the most important is that you know, what is the canonical updating order that you use here, right? Because if you're just given a hypergraph like this, there are in general many sort of many possible places in which a given uh, update rule could be applied. And in general, different, you know, different orders of applications of the update rules will yield non-isomorphic spatial hypergraphs. Um, and so that seems like kind of a problem. And, and that there doesn't seem to be a sort of canonical evaluation strategy to use. So really what you want to know is how do, the, how do different orderings of update events uh, or different applications of the update rules depend on each other? So you want to have some sort of sense of, of what's the causal relationship between each update. And so we can parameterize that using uh, what we call a causal network, which is just some directed acyclic graph in which all of the vertices are, are applications of updates. They're what we call updating events. Um, and in which you have a directed edge between events A and B 
if an, if it is the case that event B could have, could only have been applied if event A had previously been applied. And the way we can work that out is just by looking and seeing, it, does the input for event B have a non-trivial intersection with the output of event A? And then that's telling you that you know event B is making use of hyper edges that were produced by the output of event A. So then if we take our causal network and we compute its transitive reduction, we get the specification of a partial order relation. We get a Hasse diagram for a, for a causal partial order relation that's telling us the, the, the structure of causal relationships between each update. And so then in effect, what we're asking about when we ask, um, you know, so that, that, that tells us how, how different, uh, how, you know, how, how these different uh, applications of the updating rule depend on each other. And uh, so in effect, when you have a pair of update, uh, you know, updating events that are not causally related, it's telling you that it doesn't really matter in what order they get applied. But if they are causally related, then obviously it does matter. And so ultimately, what you, the question you want to ask is, uh, if, it, if we choose different kind of patterns, if we do choose different collections of, of, uh, of um, sort of evaluation strategies to use, do, does each collection yield the equivalent causal network? Are, are the causal graphs always the same? Um, so Okay, here's just a, a sort of simple example of a causal network for the uh, set sub substitution system that I showed on the previous slide, uh, showing you exactly how you know how, how these uh, how each of these events relates to each other. So this is telling you that this event and this event could be applied in any order relative to each other, but you know this event and this event, their their uh, relative ordering does actually matter. So because there's no canonical updating order, uh, in general, as I say, you, you, w rather than getting sort of a single path of evolution, you'll actually get a, you'll get a DAG, you'll get some, some uh, directed acyclic graph of, uh, of evolution steps, which we call a multi-way evolution graph or a multi-way system. So in, in this diagram, each, each vertex is just a particular state of the hypergraph. Each edge is corresponding to a rewrite. So it's kind of like, it's, you can think of one of these graphs as being like a concrete representation of the abstract rewriting structure of a Wolfram model system. And so then the, you know, a particular rewriting sequence, like the, the, the sequence I showed you right at the beginning, would correspond to just a particular path through this, through this directed acyclic graph. But it turns out that there are, um, there are particular classes, of, there's a particular class of rules for which actually it doesn't matter what path you take, the, the causal network that you see is always the same. In other words, if you, if you followed all possible paths through the multi-way system, you would, the, all the causal networks you would obtain would all be isomorphic as directed acyclic graphs. And uh, for those of you who know about, you know, abstract rewriting systems, this is deeply related to the property of global confluence or the church rosser property of the underlying rewriting system. Um, uh, the reason that's interesting for us, because, you know, we're coming at this from a, you know, wanting to understand fundamental physics uh, perspective, is that actually causal invariance is, is also directly related to Lorentz symmetry in, in relativity. And let me just quickly sort of guide you through uh, roughly how that works. So, you know, here, okay, here's an example of a multi-way system that's kind of trivially causal invariant. You can see it, there are sort of four different paths through this, through this graph that, that you could in principle trace. Uh, each of these blue vertices is denoting a state of the hypergraph. Each yellow uh, vertex is giving you, an, is specifying a rewriting event. Uh, the gray edges are showing you how the, how the states evolve from you know, one state to the next. The orange edges are showing you the causal dependency between, uh, between the rewriting events. And you can see that for each of the four possible Possible paths you could trace through the system, the causal network you get is always the same. In fact, in, in this case, it's trivial. It's just a it's just a path graph in each case. But the reason why this is of relevance to to Lorentz symmetry and to you know things like special relativity is because if you now think of the causal network as being like the you know a discrete version of the causal structure on some you know Lorentzian manifold or something, so you know so, some discrete approximation to space time then the collections of events that form anti-chains, the collections that aren't related by the causal partial order, form the analog of space-like hypersurface. Dating orders correspond to different choices of foliation of the causal network into, into space-like hypersurfaces. So here's, you know, here's a causal network with kind of a default foliation you can think of as being like some you know, cosmological rest frame or something. Uh, and this is the particular sequence of hypergraph uh, so outcomes that you see. Uh, but we could just as equally have chosen a completely different foliation like this one. We'd see a different sequence of hypergraphs. You can see that these are non-isomorphic to the hypergraphs on the previous slide. Um, but because this system is causal invariant, we guarantee that even though we've chosen a completely different foliation, uh, the combinatorial structure of the causal network remains unchanged. Um, and so 
translating that into kind of more physical terms, if you think about this as being a discrete model of space time, what this is telling you is that by choosing different updating orders, even though the ordering of space like separated events will change, the ordering of time like and, and light like separated events will remain invariant. So we immediately recover, uh, well, Lorentz symmetry, but actually also Poincare symmetry, conformal symmetry, uh, and even diffeomorphism symmetry. So actually, causal invariance is, is although it's a in terms of the rewriting structure, it's very easy to state. It's actually quite a, quite a deep and quite a strong uh, sort of uh, principle. Um, and so just to, I, I'm not going to go, obviously, th this, is, this talk will not focus particularly on the relativistic aspects of the model, but just to quickly uh, explain roughly how that works, because it will come in, in uh, an analogous concept will arise later. Um, the way we define one of these foliations formally is you're saying basically we're defining a, a, a universal time function over the causal networks. We're, map, we're defining a function that maps updating events onto some universal time value. And then, the, and then each space-like hypersurface is just the, uh, the, the spatial, the, the space-like hypersurface has just become the level sets of that universal time function. And because the, uh, because the causal network is directed in acyclic, it follows that the associated manifold is, is, is hyperbolic. And so in particular, these, uh, it, it does permit a foliation into, into Cauchy surfaces that are non-intersecting. Um, and again, I won't go into too much detail, but um, suffice it to say, we can also, in certain limits, uh, in particular when these hypergraphs have kind of well-defined manifold-like uh, limits, um, it, uh, we, we can recover essentially a discrete analog of the Einstein field equations. And uh, roughly speaking, the way that works is, you know, suppose you have a manifold-like hypergraph like this, and you want to know how many dimensions uh, of space it corresponds to, you can, you know, you pick a vertex, and then you can just look at all of the vertices that are adjacent to it, all the vertices that are adjacent to those vertices, and so on. And you grow out some finite ball of radius r, and uh, you expect it to grow like r to the d, where d is the dimension of the manifold. Uh, but if the, if the, if the uh, limiting manifold is curved, then there's a correction factor that's proportional to the Ricci scalar, or in our case, to the discrete analog of that, which is the Olivier Ricci scalar. And uh, you can do the same analysis for the causal graph. In that case, you get a, a correction. You're now growing out a finite cone, a space-time cone, and uh, you get a correction term that's proportional to a time-like projection of this discrete uh, Olivier Ricci curvature tensor. And then by enforcing the constraint that the manifold has a finite limiting dimension, that in turn forces certain constraints on the Ricci tensor, and you can prove in the most general case that those constraints are exactly the Einstein field equations. Anyway, so that, that's a sort of an, an amusing part of the model, but I'm not going not gonna to talk about it too much, uh, too much here. Um, okay, so then how does this you know, how might this start to relate to things like categorical QM and to the ZX calculus? Well, as is probably quite obvious to those of you who know about CQM, um, it's quite straightforward to represent one of these Wolfram model rules, one of these hypergraph substitution or set substitution rules as a, as a span of monomorphisms in some adhesive category. And so then uh, every time you get a rewriting match, every time you could, there's a, an applicable updating event that corresponds to the statement that a particular pair of pushout diagrams exist uh, the, uh, of this form. So uh, although we've represented, although I've represented what I've said so far in terms of set theory, it's kind of trivial to reformulate it in terms of category theory, and that will come important for some of the uh, some of the results I want to present a bit later. Okay, um, so how do you get anything resembling a, you know, a quantum formalism out of this framework? Well, going back to the multi-way evolution graphs I showed before, the, these directed acyclic graphs that parameterize all possible updating orders, you can do the same trick that we did to the causal network to these multi-way evolution graphs. So you can produce a foliation, not into space-like hypersurfaces, but into what we call branch-like hypersurfaces, because they, they're sort of spanning multiple branches of the evolution, uh, the evolution history. Uh, but other than that, the mathematical formalism is exactly the same. And so again, because they're directed in a cyclic, the associated manifold structure is hyperbolic, so you can produce such a foliation. So this is an example of a default, you know, cosmological reference frame foliation of, of a multi-way evolution graph for some particular set substitution system. And uh, uh, sort of the, the, the case started from is that maybe we can think of each vertex of this multi-way evolution graph as being a different sort of pure state for the universe. And so then when you're, when you're foliating into branch-like hypersurfaces, each hypersurface corresponds to, you know, a, a, essentially a weighted sum over those pure states. So what you've got when you evolve from one branch-like hypersurface to the next, you're really witnessing kind of the, the um, some, almost like the evolution of, of some kind of, of some sort of Hartle Hawking wave function, some kind of wave function for the, for the, for the overall hypergraph, for the overall universe in inverted commas, um, with each branch-like hypersurface indicating an instantaneous superposition. 
Um, so then the question is, okay, here's a, here's a sort of illustration of how, how that would work. So these are, uh, if we take the example we showed uh, over here, this is when we foliate this into branch like hypersurfaces, these are the individual hypersurfaces that we would see. So these are the instantaneous superpositions. And we've also drawn edges here that show the common ancestor distance. So if it's a, um, two, uh, two state vertices are connected by a pink uh, edge in, in, in these what we call branchial graphs, uh, if and only if they, sh they have a common ancestor uh, uh, at one level back in the multi-way evolution graph. And these, branch these kinds of branchial graphs that show common ancestor distance between states uh, will come in relevant in just a moment when we talk about uh, sort of relationships to, to geometric uh, quantization. So um, one of the interesting features of that is that uh, we can show that at least in certain cases, specifically in cases where the multi-way evolution graph has the form of an orthomodular lattice, so it has some nice algebraic properties, then uh, just like in the hypergraph case, we could show that you know, as the hypergraph gets infinitely large, the, the graph metric limits to a, a Riemannian metric, you get the same thing occurring with these branchial graphs, but rather than uh, sort of reducing to a, to a spatial metric on, on some space like hypersurface, it reduces to the Fubini study metric on a projective Hilbert space. And so in effect, what that's telling you is that at least in certain cases, if you think of these as being instantaneous superpositions between pure states, the natural graph distance is showing you some kind of, an, it, is, it gives you a way of, of computing some kind of entanglement distance uh, b uh, between the associated states, or, or more, more precisely, it's, it's giving you a way of computing entanglement entropies. So just to give you a, an example of how that works in a sort of really trivial case, you know, imagine if we, uh, instead of thinking about um, multi-way multi -way graphs produced by hypergraphs, what if we considered multi-way graphs produced by explicit quantum states? Well, then you could define an abstract rewriting rule based on, say, a square root not gate, apply it to an initial superposition state of you know, 1 over root 2 ket naught plus ket 1, and you would get a multi-way evolution that looked like that. And so here we're just showing each, um, so each evolution edge is showing you an, an individual rewrite produced by, that, produced by this square root not rule. And the numbers here are showing you path weighting. So they're telling you, uh, you know, when you, when you see a number like six that's associated with a particular state vertex, it's telling you that there are six independent paths that could have led you to that particular state. And so then uh, the, the, the essential idea is when you foliate that into branch-like hypersurfaces, uh, the, the, as I say, each branch-like hypersurface gives you, a, uh, gives you an instantaneous superposition between those, between those eigenstates uh, it, where, the, where the path weightings tell you the magnitudes of the amplitudes. And so if we, if we do that foliation, you get uh, branchial graphs that look like this. And it's not too difficult to convince yourself if you want to go through and, and check that, uh, that you do indeed get the right answers, that, 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 that this is actually a valid simulation of, of the application of a square root not gate. And we've done this with kind of arbitrary quantum circuits. And you know, perhaps unsurprisingly, it, it works just fine. And you do indeed find that, that, the, that as these branchial graphs become arbitrarily large, the, uh, the, the graph distance between associated pure states uh, becomes a closer and closer approximation to the standard entanglement distance between those states. Okay, um, so how does any of this connect to things that uh, you guys might care about and, and to you know, things relating to, to QIT and to, to ZX calculus? Well, we were interested in, as I say, we, we'd been able to prove various results about the quantum side of our formalism. Uh, but it, it had depended on, on very kind of restrictive assumptions. It had depended on, you know, these special cases of considering, you know, multi-way systems which have the, which have the, the structure of, of uh, orthomodular lattices and things. And we wanted to know, was there a more general way we could, we could think about this stuff? Was there, a, uh, was there a way we could prove much more general theorems? Um, and so we'd, we kind of, we'd been interested in trying to understand the correspondence with, with CQM and with, with the ZX calculus for a little while. Uh, and, and, uh, we, we thought that you know hitting this roadblock with our with our previous approach was kind of the impetus for for getting started on on, on really seriously thinking about that so what we did was we we realized that um we could just you know the the you know the the, the diagrammatic rewriting rules of the zx calculus can very easily be simulated as a special case of one of these hypergraph uh, substitution systems um that with with the only real technical subtlety being that uh, the we have finite rewriting systems, the ZX calculus is of course an infinite rewriting system because you know things like the ZX fusion rules or the identity rules or whatever uh, are intended to work for you know uh, ZX spiders with arbitrary input and output arity. So effectively, for each possible uh, configuration of input and output arities, uh, there's a different rewriting rule that one could apply. So actually, you have to be able to deal not with individual rules but with in, with infinite rule schemas. And so other um, you know diagrammatic rewriting frameworks like Quantumatic use things like the bang box notation to deal with that, we had to develop uh, an approach that was essentially based on second order logic. 
uh, in order to be able to simulate that. But with a little bit of effort, we were able to effectively compile the ZX calculus into one of our Wolfram model uh, multiway systems. So this is what you get, you, you know, starting from some simple ZX diagram like this, you know, with a, a Hadamard spider and a computational basis spider. Uh, you can then just say, well, what happens if I apply all possible ZX rewritings? And I, you know, so after one step, I get this multiway evolution graph. Uh, after two steps, I get this somewhat more complicated multiway evolution graph. Um, and in addition, obviously, to, to looking just at the rewriting structure, we can also start to look at the causal structure. So we can start to look at, you know, effectively what is, uh, you know, what what are the patterns of causal dependencies between rewriting events that occur in the ZX calculus? And we start. So this is a, a subset of the of the of the full multi-way uh, causal graph for, uh, for for the ZX rewritings on on this particular diagram. This is what the full multi-way causal graph looks like. So it's uh, suffice it to say, it's a little bit it's a little bit complicated. Um, but this is already kind of interesting because it lets us using our using our formalism it, it allows us to address these kind of questions like you know what is the limiting manifold structure of zx rewritings uh, which as far as i know is not really a question that's really been addressed before but it's one that that we now have potentially the ability to to address and and uh, rather excitingly it does seem that there is a there is a definite manifold with a definite lorentzian signature that does seem to emerge in the limit of an arbitrarily large number of zx rewritings but the one that's somewhat dependent on the topology of the initial diagram in a slightly subtle way. And we're currently, this is a fairly recent realization that we're currently looking into. We don't really understand how that works yet. Okay, so um, the reason we thought that this was, was worth doing to, to, you know, to compile the ZX calculus to, to our sort of, uh, to, 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 to our framework was that we'd been interested, we'd sort of made this conjecture that, uh, so our multi-way evolution graphs and our branchial graphs should be equipped with some kind of tensor product structure, a monoidal structure that's given by the parallel application of rewriting rules. And, you know, intuitively that seemed like this should be the case. So if you have, if you imagine sort of multi-way systems based on string substitution, so, you know, here's one based on the rule A goes to AB, here's another one based on the rule A goes to BA. And suppose we wanted to take the, uh, and, and suppose we wanted to take the tensor product of those two multi-way systems, an obvious, a fairly natural way to do that would just be to compute, to produce a, a, a composite substitution system where both the rules A goes to AB and A goes to BA could be applied in parallel. And so then you get this kind of higher dimensional multi-way evolution graph where you can see that the two lower dimensional multi-way evolution graphs form a kind of spanning set. And the same thing happens on uh, with the branchial graphs as well. So here are the branchial graphs for those for those particular uh, sets of, for those particular string substitution systems. And after taking that monoidal product or that that putative monoidal product, these are the branchial graphs you get. Again, uh, sort of effectively spanned by the two lower dimensional branchial graphs. And uh, but the although this seemed like a very natural way of taking monoidal products in our in our formalism, we weren't able to, and, and actually it's, it's trivial to prove that this is a monoidal product because it's basically just given by disjoint union of rules. So it trivially satisfies the, the you know, the requisite association, uh, uh, associator and, and symmetry isomorphisms. But um, proving that this was actually the kind of the monoidal product that you care about, i.e. the monoidal product of finite dimensional Hilbert spaces, which is ultimately what we wanted to show, that was something we, we didn't really know what, to, uh, we didn't really know how to, how to do. And the reason it was kind of difficult was because this particular um, monoidal structure doesn't, it doesn't correspond to, an, to any kind of ordinary well-known monoidal structure uh, defined over the category of graphs. So in particular, it's, it's certainly neither the standard Cartesian product nor the, nor the standard Kronecker product of graphs because it has this additional subtlety, which is that you know, states are effectively merged by, uh, by state equivalence or by hypergraph isomorphism. And that adds kind of additional uh, gluing transformations that makes it quite different from, it, from even a graph Kronecker product. So the question was, what, what is this monoidal product? And is it actually, as we suspected it was, is it really the, the same as the monoidal product of finite dimensional Hilbert spaces? Well, the exciting thing was that using the ZX calculus, we were able to show it, it actually was. So essentially what we did was we, we said, okay, look, so um, we know how to take monoidal products in, in the ZX calculus. We just sort of stack diagrams on top of each other. And we know how to take monoidal products of multi-weighting rules in parallel. And can we prove that these two operations are actually the same? Can we prove that they're actually compatible? Well, we tested the conjecture. So, so you know, so you start from uh, you know the, the, a, a single monoidal uh, diagram, uh, sorry, a single ZX diagram, uh, applying you know one particular rewriting rule on, on the left, applying a different rewriting rule on, on the right, uh, you know, yielding these two particular sets of, of branchial graphs. Then we could apply both rules in parallel. So we take essentially the multi-way monoidal product, 
and we get this associated branchial graph. But if we then went and we took the monoidal product of the ZX diagrams in the usual way by stacking them on top of each other, you would get, as it turns out, an isomorphic multi-way evolution graph and an isomorphic branchial graph. And again, testing this over several thousand examples of you know, uh, diagrams of different sizes and rewriting rules of different kinds, uh, it seemed to be correct. So you know, this seemed to be a, a conjecture that was actually worth proving. And in the end, we, we were able to prove it by extending some of the re results of, uh, of Lucas Dixon and Alex Kissinger, uh, who proved that the, ca that the, category, the category of directed co-spans uh, of open graphs uh, is, is endowed with a monoidal structure that's the same as the, uh, effectively uh, compatible with the monoidal structure of ZX, di of ZX diagrams. Um, and so what we did was we just basically lifted their argument kind of one level of abstraction up. So we, starting from the category of open graphs, you can then consider the, ca the category of um, oh yeah, so so, so uh, this is the this is Dixon and Kissinger's proof of the the, uh, the category of directed cospans uh, of uh, over the category of open graphs. If you take the the coproduct of a, of a pair of cospans, then that essentially uh, equips that category with a mon with a natural monoidal structure. Um, but another thing that the that Dixon and Kissinger give us is an extension of the of the double pushout rewriting rules that I showed at the beginning to this more general category, going beyond the category of graphs to the category of open graphs, i.e., to, to the to the category of graphs where you know uh, you can have edges that don't actually have vertices to the endpoints that just kind of hang loose as like inputs or outputs of your ZX diagrams, um, and so. What we realized was that you could actually you could construct a category of selective adhesive rewriting rules uh, where the selective adhesivity is a way of ex of extending the adhesive category construction to these to these uh, to rewriting rules over over these open graphs and construct if you construct the category of directed cospans over selective adhesive rules then the monoidal structure from the category of directed cospans over the open graphs lifts up to that new category. And so now you can take the co-product of the associated uh, selective adhesive rules and you get a monoidal structure on, on, on that. And uh, the reason that's interesting to us is because that, uh, but is that by taking the co-product of the selective adhesive rules, you're effectively taking the disjoint union of, of the associated rewriting, uh, re rewriting relations, uh, which is essentially what we were doing with the multi-way case. So by essentially a fairly straightforward modification of, of uh, Dixon and Kissinger's argument for the ZX case, we were indeed able to prove that our that the monoidal products that we were considering in the context of our multi-way formalism was the same as the monoidal product that people were considering in the context of the ZX calculus. And uh, you know, with a little bit more effort, you can show that in fact these multi-way systems and these branchial graphs satisfy all of the axioms of a of a you know of a, a dagger symmetric uh, monoidal category, where you know the dagger structure is given by reversal of the evolution edges and and, and things like that. And, and you can prove uh, compatibility of the dagger structure with the monoidal structure and all of that all that nice stuff. And so uh, what that meant for us was that therefore we, we could show that, you know, it was that the objects we were getting out were dagger symmetric monoidal categories of exactly the same kind as the, uh, you know, as the dagger symmetric monoidal categories, uh, or, or of exactly the same kind as the, as the uh, monoidal, monoidal category of finite dimensional Hilbert spaces under a tensor product operation, which was ultimately the thing that we cared about. So, so our prior conjecture that um, when we were taking these monoidal products of, of multi-way systems, it was analogous to taking, uh, you know, tensor products of finite dimensional Hilbert spaces, that actually gave us a kind of category, the, the, this particular argument based on the ZX calculus gave us a purely category theoretic way of proving that that conjecture was actually right, which was pretty cool. So that was that's kind of the, the the main topic of the of the preprint I showed at the beginning. That this this preprint I wrote I wrote with uh, with Namdurin Asawa. Um, I just like to finish by by talk. I, I also I mentioned a couple of things that we're sort of thinking about at the moment uh, about sort of trying to investigate the limiting manifold structure of, of ZX diagrams and things like that. My internet connection is unstable. That's a bad sign. Hopefully you can still hear me. Um, but I just like to I'd like to finish by just mentioning a couple of um, sort of. Other directions, which I think might be of interest to sort of the the more general ZX calculus quantum information, you know, categorical quantum mechanics community. So one of these is an application of the formalism we've developed for doing, uh, you know, automated theorem proving and automated uh, you know, automated rewriting thing and automated verification over algorithms. So um, we have developed fairly efficient automated theorem proving algorithms based on things like knuth bendix completion, uh, superposition calculus, that kind of stuff uh, for doing uh, automated reasoning over our multi-way system. So if you have, you know, uh, 
a Wolfram model uh, set substitution rule of this form and you uh, of this form down here, the XXY, XXY goes to YYX, et cetera, rule, and you want to prove that these hypergraphs are, are ultimately equivalent with respect to that rule, we have a theorem proving algorithm that lets you do that. You know, this particular proof requires 62 steps. Uh, like I mentioned, it's basically using a sort of a knuth benix completion, superposition calculus, paramodulation based uh, theorem proving algorithm. But actually, we've been able to make a bunch of optimizations based on uh, our sort of new intuitions from multi-way systems by, for instance, only picking lemmas for the automated re uh, rewritings uh, that sort of maximize the causal edge density. So if you want, when, when, you, when, select, when doing automated theorem proving over you know, a quantum circuit or something, when adding in lemmas to your, to your reasoning uh, system, you want to pick the lemmas that are going to have the maximum effect on shortening future lem or shortening the proofs of future lemmas. And actually, uh, these multi-way systems give you a way of, of, of heuristically predicting which ones those will be, uh, because they'll be the ones that have the maximal outgoing causal edge density, the maximal causal effect on future updating events. And we've discovered just empirically that by incorporating that particular heuristic optimization, we can reduce the computational complexity and the proof complexity quadratically. And that lets us do kind of uh, efficient automated rewriting and automated reasoning over ZX diagrams and therefore over quantum circuits. So, you know, here's a very simple proof of equivalence between ZX diagrams, you know, modulo the ZX rewriting rules. Um, and we, we, uh, we have functionality that's available open source, I'll talk about it at the end, that lets us do kind of arbitrary, uh, sort of, lets us do arbitrary automated proofs of correctness and, and uh, proofs of semantics of, of arbitrary quantum circuits uh, using this kind of optimized theorem proving framework that at least when we've compared it against kind of things like uh, uh, PyZX and, uh, and, and Quantumatic and so on, uh, at least in restrict, restricted class of, classes of cases, uh, our sort of automated rewriting uh, procedures do seem to be more efficient because they've incorporated these, these sort of multi-way uh, optimizations. Another slightly more speculative sort of place where I think that the framework we've been developing might uh, sort of help inform you know, research in, in areas like categorical quantum mechanics uh, is in sort of um, giving you a fairly systematic procedure for doing, uh, you know, proofs of completeness, proofs of consistency, com proofs of soundness of, um, you know, of, uh, of diagrammatic rewriting rules. So I know that there's a kind of, there's a whole uh, cottage industry right now uh, with people like Miriam Backens and others kind of proving various completeness and soundness results of, uh, of diagrammatic rewriting rules for, for, for quantum circuits. Um, so, you know, in particular now, you know, ZX calculus is known to be, is known to be complete and consistent for stabilizer quantum mechanics. And there are similar kind of efforts going on in, uh, to, to sort of to prove consistency of things like the ZH and ZW uh, calculi as well. Um, actually, our multi-way system formalism gives you a, a fairly systematic way of doing those kinds of proofs as well. Uh, so just as a very, very simple example of roughly how that works. Um, if you, uh, if you imagine kind of, um, if you imagine the, these these multi-way systems as being like a very very idealized version of a of a diagrammatic re, of a logical diagrammatic rewriting language, in which you have you know one and zero maybe representing true and false, uh, where where one and zero are kind of each other's negation, then uh, you know in, in this particular case here we can infer that the from from the structure of the multi-way system we can see that the associated rewriting system must be incomplete because there are certain strings like one 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 for which the the multi-way system n neither generates one 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 nor its negation zero 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 uh, on the right here there's an example of a multi-way system where we can infer that the rewriting system that the uh, that the associated sort of axiomatic uh, foundation is actually inconsistent because there are certain strings like zero one zero for which both zero one zero and its negation one zero one are generated but then there's a sweet spot kind of in between in which you have a, a, a multi-way system like this where you know both where every either for any possible string either the string or its negation is is generated but never both and so uh, so th this is you know this is an example of a of a, a multi-way system generated by an axiomatic rewriting system that we can infer is both complete and consistent and where the underlying inference rules are therefore sound um, and so, so this gives. So we we previously used our multi-way system framework to do, you know, systematic completeness and soundness proofs for for um, uh, algebraic axiom systems in, in in pure mathematics. And we have, given that we now have this kind of compilation of the ZX calculus and, and diagrammatic rewritings over quantum circuits into uh, this multi-way framework. Rather excitingly, this potentially gives us a way of doing kind of uh, generalized proofs of completeness and consistency. 
for the ZX calculus, you know, the diagrammatic calculi like like ZW and ZH, uh, which I think will, will potentially be qu be quite exciting, and that's something that we're we're um, we're really sort of uh, eager to, to to work on uh, in the near future. Uh, I think that's pretty much everything I wanted to say. Uh, I've, I've um, Okay, I've, I've left a reasonable amount of time for questions because that's obviously going to be the more interesting part of this. I just wanted to quickly mention at the end that, uh, that all of the code that, uh, that was used to uh, produce the diagrams in this presentation, all the code for uh, producing all of the arguments in the paper, that's all free, open source. Uh, you can go and download it from the Wolfram Function Repository. You know, we have code for generating ZX diagrams. We have code for doing uh, automated reasoning over quantum circuits. We have code for generating arbitrary multiway systems and uh, you know, analyzing their causal structure, uh, all of that kind of stuff. So if you want to have a play around with some of the things that I've shown here, uh, you, you can go and do that. And if you want to see uh, and read more about, uh, you know, about what we've been up to, you can go read our preprints on, on the Wolfram Physics website. But uh, anyway, so that's a very, very quick sort of overview of, of some of the stuff we've been doing that's at the interface between the Wolfram model and the ZX calculus. And uh, I'd be very happy to, to take questions. Hi, Jonathan. Thanks a lot for this very interesting talk. You can have a lot of claps from me, but also I see claps from Ross and Will. Um, Thank Ross you. <laughs> has his hand up already, ready to answer, uh, to ask some questions. So, Ross, please go ahead. Uh, thanks, Christina. Thank, thank you very much, Jonathan. That was a really stimulating talk, and it's uh, very nice to see some, some issues that I have not thought about in years um, come alive again. I have a lot of questions I would like to ask, mostly about the rewriting side. Um, sure. So I guess um, I might, you might, you went quite fast, so I might have got the wrong end of the stick here, but I thought you said at some point that you had found a way to make the ZX system strongly normalizing. Was that correct or did I miss that? Uh, no. So, um... Yes, yeah, so as you are well aware, the ZX uh, calculus system is not strongly normalizing. But um, in so for the case of doing uh, sort of automated theorem proving, what you want to be able to do, ideally, is to be able to take fragments of it and and construct an equational theory that that has the same deductive strongly normalizing, which you can do in at least some cases. You can't make the whole system strongly normalizing. Uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, and, and a sort of related point, I guess, since it's about infinities, is that, so we know very well the, quant the performance of quantumatic as a, as a theorem prover is pretty bad. <laughs> and part of the graph matching on bang boxes is extremely complex. Yes. Um, so I was, you mentioned that you, you removed the bang boxes and implemented that somehow or else. So how did you do that? Yeah, so I I must confess, I don't, um, uh, you, you might be able to uh, sort of summarize it quickly. I, I must confess, I don't really understand how the bang boxes work in, in the implementation of, of, uh, of Quantumatic. Um, so it's entirely possible that what we've done is, is equivalent. Um, but um, so basically we, we have an automated theorem proving framework that works for second order logic um, that's based on higher inductive types. And um, so essentially what we did was rather than using something like the bang box notation, we just reformulated the ZX. So, you know, each rewriting rule can be reformulated as an equational rule in, you know, in, in the, well, in the equational fragment of first order logic. But then these infinite rule schemas can in turn be represented as single rules in a second order equational theory. And so then you lift the problem up, so you then want to do you know theorem proving over that over that second order theory, which we can which we can then use just using standard you know higher order logic uh, proving techniques, uh, in, in particular based on these higher inductive types. Um, I have no idea how that compares to to what Quantumatic does. I, I you you may you may have more information on that. It uh, it certainly doesn't use second order logic. Is it is it um, MSO logic you're using in particular, or is it something else? Uh, sorry, I, I I didn't catch that word. Sorry, which, which logic? Monadic second order logic you're using, or is it something? Oh, else? it's it's not it's not monadic. No, it's it, it's um so it's uh it's a yeah it, it's 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 not it's 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 an equational it's an equational fragment of a of a non monadic second order logic. Interesting. Okay, I'll need to follow up on that. Um, I'm going to let someone else have the mic before I ask my next ten questions. Sure, but. 
um, it'd be fun to follow up. All right, well, I'll ask one more then. So the the application of this stuff to um, space-time structure seems very, very interesting. We see in some other areas of physics, uh, other very similar structures, like all the underlying Hopf algebra stuff shows up in condensed matter physics quite a lot. And in these settings, we are typically looking at an underlying category which is braided or just simply not not symmetric so not braided at all i mean no symmetry do you think that the techniques that you've used to formalize the symmetric version of those calculus could be generalized to these settings yeah that's a really interesting question so uh, um the short answer is i i don't know um it's something we're interested in figuring out so so the the, the way that we've yeah, the, the way that we've set this up, you know, the, the, the symmetry isomorphisms are kind of inevitable. Um, but we are very much interested in can, is what is the natural, I mean, okay, with one of these, when you have a multi-way system, um, the construction of the monoidal structure, the construction of the dagger structure is all very natural. So far, we haven't been able to find a correspondingly natural, you know, construction of the, of the, uh, of the braiding isomorphism, if one exists. But I'm very much open to the possibility that there could be one. I just, I don't currently know what it might be. Um. Yeah, so I have, um, I have a PhD student and we've been working on a related topic for a while, which is basically to do um, double push out graph writing, but in surface embedded graphs. Uh -huh. And of course, if you just make the braiding into a normal algebraic rule, then you can handle it inside that that setting. Now, the more interesting thing would be actually use the the topology of the surface for that. But how to do it, I do not know. <laughs> right, right. I mean, yes, uh, you you can for one of these. You know, when you have one of these multiway systems, you can add in any algebraic axioms that you wanted to. So, in principle, you could yeah, you you could restrict um, the symmetry isomorphism to become a braiding isomorphism. But as as you correctly say, I mean, the, the question is, is there is there a natural way that something like a braiding would would arise? And um, I'm very much open to suggestions about that because that is something that we're interested in figuring out. So I mean, if we throw away the the braiding completely and you just say that I require my diagrams to be planar, is that something that fits in naturally? That's probably more natural. Yes, um, the, um, we have a, a very much incomplete sort of classification of. Um, you know, uh, essentially gra graph theoretic topological obstructions and the, you know, the, the associated rewriting structure that you get in the multiway system. And in particular, we've, you know, we've tried to make a, a sort of connection between, uh, you know, collections of forbidden minors in, in the, in the Seymour Robertson sort of characterization and the associated uh, multiway structures that you obtain. Um, and we have one person uh, who's kind of currently in our group, who's kind of trying to, trying to really uh, make that correspondence precise. Um, and so, yeah, in that particular case, the um, the sort of the, the planarity related topological obstructions would give you some fairly natural multi-way structure whose type I don't know offhand. Um, but yes, that that, pro that probably is a more natural way to do it than than trying to sort of force in a braiding structure. Um, I think I should let Nathan have a go. Hello. Thanks, thanks for the nice talk. So the graph structure and the, the Lorentz symmetry that you showed struck me a lot to remind me of quantum loop gravity, where you're quantizing space time into a tensor network. Yes. Could you speak a bit more about possibly the link there? Yeah. Okay. So, so yes, uh, th there's, there are a lot of links between what we're doing and other sort of, you know, discrete space time is not a new idea. Um, there have been other approaches. So, so, um, there's, I think I mentioned causal set theory, which is this approach to um, basically generating these, so the, the, these causal networks that we have, uh, essentially, you know, their, their transitive reductions very naturally form causal sets. Um, but causal set theory has primarily focused on kinematics. 
and the, you know, the dynamics for generating the you know, causal sets that they've considered have mostly been stochastic. Our, you know, our dynamics are, are entirely algorithmic. And so, so, so what we're doing is sort of quite fundamentally different to, to what causal set theory has considered. In terms of LQG, um, yeah, so as, as you correctly say, LQG is another sort of background independent discrete space time approach based on sort of spin networks that are representing the, you know, the, the, the quantum state of gravitational field on a particular space like hypersurface and then spin foams, which are kind of the time evolved version of that, which is showing, you know, superpositions of, of, of actual space times. So in effect, but once again, in LQG, the dynamics are quite different because what you, what you generally do there is you start from a background manifold then you discretize it by, by, you know, by considering these superpositions uh, to, to create a spin network or, or a spin foam. Uh, and, and then you define an action integral over, this, over the spin foam. Um, whereas what we're doing effectively is rather than starting from a manifold and then defining the dynamics in terms of an action on, on, on the foam, it's kind of like we're dynamically generating the spin foam. So, so the, the spin foam is being algorithmically produced as a consequence of these hypergraph rewriting systems. Um, there are some other approaches like uh, there's causal dynamical triangulation, which is another background independent approach that's quite similar to spin foams. Uh, but again, they kind of, they start from a background space time and then they discretize it and then define actions over the, over the discretized uh, thing. Uh, so the, the, the sort of, the key point of philosophical departure, I'd say between what we're doing and, and a lot of these other discrete space time approaches as considered in LQG um, is that we are, we're, we're trying to generate the manifold structure sort of dynamically from some algorithmic principles rather than discretizing a manifold, a background manifold that already exists and defining a dynamics on, on the discretized form. Um, so, so the dynamics is, is the dynamics then evolved as like these steps of the graph branching yes. levels essentially. Okay. Cool. Yes, exactly. So, so, so each, so each of these, each of these applications of a rewriting rule is a space time event in this, in this way of thinking about things. Um, and, and that then, yeah, th these, these different, these different foliations into into space like hypersurfaces give you then the univ the you know the, the values of the universal time function for for that particular space time, and so um, there are cases in which the which I which I think I showed some pictures of, where the the limiting structure you get out is manifold like, and we can actually prove in in certain restricted cases that these causal networks, for instance, have a faithful embedding into a in, into a in, into a Lorentzian manifold of a particular type uh, where in that case faithful embedding just means some you know some that there exists some uh, some approximate isometry that that specializes the, the the causal structure of the Lorentzian manifold onto the causal structure of the network um, and so so that that gives us kind of hope that um, basically we it gives us a way of reproducing the uh, you know dynamics that are similar to that which are considered in something like a spin foam in, in LQG but without the need to actually start from the manifold structure, right? The manifold structure becomes the sort of emergent feature of the dynamics. Um, just, a, just a minor follow-up in that. So is, is this approach to studying gravity related at all to this work of Pablo Origi and various collaborators on causal graph dynamics? It seems quite similar. Uh, it, it, it is somewhat similar. So, so um, I've read a bit of Pablo's stuff. I, I don't claim to be an expert on it. Um, a lot of it seems to be involved in um, sort of defining, getting kind of geometrical structures out of random graphs and, and, and looking at effectively, a, a bit like with causal set theory, essentially looking at stochastic dynamics and then getting out uh, sort of manifold-like structures from that. And that makes a lot of sense because you know having because having some some randomization in your i mean okay the problem with trying to get something continuous out of a you know out of a graph like structure is that you you know how do you get something like a Riemannian metric and and, and not sort of a, a manhattan metric and uh you know a random graph or, so, or some other kind of stochastic dynamics is a fairly natural way of, of resolving that problem because it kind of naturally softens out this this combinatorial distance metric to give you something much more like a Riemannian metric um what we're doing is different in a few senses, but but I, I'd say that the, the the main point of departure from those other kind of more stochastic type approaches is that this is a completely deterministic update system. So we, you know we're considering rules where the underlying rewriting system is confluent, where one has causal invariance. So in effect, it doesn't matter what what evolution order you you choose. Um, the, the the although the hyper although the um, which particular hypergraphs you see is somewhat arbitrary and dependent on the updating order, the structure of the causal network, which is ultimately the thing you care about, is always the same. 
And then we, we have other sort of ways of getting around this problem of how do you soften the combinatorial distance metric, which is basically, as I showed briefly, by, by, you, by instead, of, instead of just considering individual sort of graph GD6, one considers doing uh, sort of GD, one considers computing GD6 between balls of some finite extent in, in that graph. So you, you essentially, you, you, you puff out a ball of radius R um, and then you look at, you know, what's the average distance between points on that ball and points on another ball sort of a short distance away after parallel transport. And then that sort of, that puffing out process gives you a way of softening the, the combinatorial distance metric on the graph without having to resort to, to sort of um, introducing uh, randomness or r randomness or stochastic dynamics or anything like that. Um, but it does kind of suggest the, the question that the initial choice of your, your start diagram seems like it might be quite important. I mean, what, what effects do you see from that? Yes, it, it's, it's hugely important. Um, and we don't, we've done sort of a, a small amount of incomplete zoology of, you know, rules and, and initial conditions, but there isn't yet, a, there isn't yet really a systematic theory there. Um, yes, so the so the interesting okay, what uh, there are a few interesting phenomena that we have observed. One is that when you have rules that have a tendency to grow the hypergraph dramatically, so in particular, if the if the output of the rule is sort of more than twice the size of the input of the rule, then it seems that the dynamics are almost entirely determined by the initial condition for the, for those kinds of rules, almost entirely determined by the initial condition, and the limiting dynamics bizarrely depend very little on the actual details of the rule. When you have rules that that grow more, which grow the hypergraph more slowly, then you get progressively more sensitivity of the dynamics to the structure of the rule and less sensitivity to the initial condition. Uh, we don't completely understand why that is, or indeed if that's even a robust effect. But that's something that we have observed, and and I agree, it's. Um, Understanding the interplay between uh, yeah, between the initial the initial conditions and and the and the choice of rule is something we would like to we would like to sort of develop further. Yeah, I mean, if, if you're thinking about the the ZX diagrams in this context, I mean, you were describing it sort of as as a dynamics, but of course, in the standard interpretation of the ZX term, every point you can reach in that dynamics is the same vector, right? It's yep. sort of equal. Uh, Yes. Okay. Right. Yes. So, uh, yeah. That, that's that's an important. Um, yeah. That's an important point of clarification. Exactly. So so be, because the rewriting relations for the when we did this compilation into the multiway systems, obviously the rewriting relations for the ZX calculus are equational. And as you say, if, you know, of course, you know, so each each uh, evolution edge is telling you not that this diagram evolves to this diagram, but rather you know this diagram is just algebraically equivalent to this diagram. Um, so it's from a from a physics point of view, it's obviously quite different. But the interesting thing is that from a from a purely kind of mathematical formalism point of view, um, it's it's really very. We use that X formalism to help inform what we're doing, which is quite nice. Mm. Yes. Yes. Okay, I I will ask one more, and then I will stop. The is kind of related to the previous one. So you were showing, um, sorry, I've forgotten the term, the, the diagram that has the, the evolution of the, 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 the rewrite rules, but also the relations between the rewrite rules. Yes, uh, so we, uh, the, the full title is a bit of a mouthful. We normally call this a, a multi-way evolution causal graph. But... Okay, <laughs> so something that we have considered in the past and didn't really go anywhere was to look at these rewrite systems as higher categories. Yep. And I was wondering if there was any sense in which these multi-way causal rewrite diagrams um, could be thought of as, as higher categories as well. Yes, absolutely. Because so, the, uh, as as I'm sure you've you've noticed, basically, there's a natural interpretation out of these causal edges as two cells, because if each if you interpret each, you know, multi-way evolution edge, each event as being just a, a, a morphism, then or as a, as a one morphism, then what the causal edges are doing are, you know, telling you morphisms between one morphisms. So, so yes, the the, the multi-way evolution causal graph is quite naturally a higher categorical object. Um, I don't. I must confess, I don't know that that necessarily buys you a huge amount. Uh, but realizing that, um, the 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 one place where it gets potentially a little bit interesting 
Um, and this is now going into a very, very speculative direction. But um, so if, when you can, so, okay, so in that interpretation of, you know, evolution edges are one morphisms, causal edges are two morphisms, then you start to get, you know, you can start to interpret things like completions when you have a, you have a critical pair in your rewriting system, and then you, you know, you're adding sort of rules that map rules onto other rules, then those completions and then the completions of those completions give you a way of kind of going to progressively higher order, uh, you know, higher order morphisms to, to, uh, to sort of constructing progressively higher order categories. And then the, the limiting case of that that you get by effectively applying all possible completions um, is some trivially confluent, trivially causal invariant uh, rewriting system that effectively parameterizes all possible rules of a particular size. And so we call this thing a rule or multi-way system. So, you know, in the case of, uh, I don't know, in the case of hypergraphs, it would just be, you know, all hypergraph transformation rules of a particular sort of combinatorial signature. And then, so in that higher categorical interpretation of what these causal ledges are, the rule or multi-way system is then something is then effectively an infinity groupoid. It has a groupoid structure because everything ends up, all the morphisms end up being symmetric, um, and it's an infinity category because it's something you obtain after applying, uh, you know, after going, um, after applying an infinite collection of completions to completions. And uh, the place where that starts to get a little bit interesting, although as I say, this is a very speculative thing, is that there's this you know result of the homotopy hypothesis that. Uh, due to growth and that says basically all infinity groupoids have a top are topological spaces that the homotopy type on the infinity groupoid is the standard homotopy type of, of, of topological spaces. Um, and that would give us potentially an alternative way of proving that, uh, that these combinatorial structures have a well-defined manifold like limits, because then that would, what that would mean was you could interpret any given causal network or any given multi-way system as being a local section of this topological space, and it would inherit, and so by the homotopy hypothesis, it would inherit certain topological structure from this sort of infinity groupoid object. But um, that's the that's the only place uh, that, that's a that's a somewhat crazy idea, um, and it's the, it's the only place so far where we found a definite use for higher you know for higher category theory in the interpretation of these systems. But um, you might have other suggestions, but but so far that's the that's the only <laughs> only interesting place we've been able to apply that. That is very interesting, actually. Unfortunately, I have to go to another meeting now, so I'm going to just depart. Uh, thank you very much for the talk, and I uh, hope to speak to you again. Yeah, it would be, be great to, to correspond more about, about some of the stuff. Can I just ask one last question? That's all right. Please do. So when, when you say higher categories, is that kind of equivalent to like higher symmetries? So like, if you were to work in, for example, like a spin angular momentum basis, uh -huh. how would that be applied? In, in your model? Um, so, okay, so I, I'm not aware of an immediate connection between higher categories and higher sim. Um, if we formulate this thing in terms of a spin angular momentum basis, so these, the choices of foliation of the multi-way evolution graph that I, that I showed earlier. So whereas different, as, as we mentioned, sort of different choices of foliation of the, of the causal network uh, you know, correspond to different choices of, of reference frame in, in the space-time case. Different choices of the multi-way evolution graph in the sort of quantum mechanical case correspond to different choices of, 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 of sort of canonical basis. Um, and, and so, so the, 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 the class of possible sort of parameterized changes of foliation correspond to the, you know, to, 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 uh, correspond to exactly to the class of, of, uh, of permissible uh, changes between, between bases. And so something like a spin angular momentum basis would be a, a particular choice of foliation, which in that particular case would be defined only for an infinite limit of a multi-way evolution graph. I don't think there's, I don't think there's a, or at least we haven't found a way to do it. I don't think there's a way you can define a spin angular momentum basis on a, on only a finite, on a multi-way evolution graph with a finite extent. Um, but that's generally speaking how, how, you know, how quantum bases are parameterized in this model. Yeah. I'm just thinking from a chemistry point of view because spin obviously gives you a lot of structure in your wave function that you can, can take advantage of. So. Right, right. Yeah, absolutely. But um, yeah, that's, it's still, I mean, we're still very much, it's still very early days on the kind of quantum foundation side of this, of this formalism. And so we don't, we don't really know what spin is. We have, you know, we have conjectures, we've done, we've looked at special cases in which you get kind of, you know, in which you start to get things like anti-commuting field operators, but it's really, really very, very early there. We, you know, um, one of the next kind of big things that we would really like to be able to show is some restricted case of the spin statistics theorem. 
Um, and again, we, we have a, we have some conjectures on because there's a fairly natural way you can formulate a sort of anti-commuting field operators in terms of uh, sort of in terms of non-convergent sets of critical pairs in the multi-way evolution graph. Um, but whether you can get something like a full full spin statistics theorem, that's something we don't yet know the answer to, and something we we definitely like to explore. But yes, we, I think we're. I'd say we're a little way away from being able to do anything sort of of, of, of definite practical use for something like quantum chemistry. But that's. Uh, yeah, definitely something we, we'd like to we'd like to be able to support. Well, thanks. Yeah, no problem. Great question. Uh, I'm aware we're over time, so we should probably probably wrap up. I don't want to keep people here. <laughs>